Hey, good morning, folks. This is Jeff Besson. Well, I don't know where you are. It's a good morning somewhere, certainly here. Very glad to have you join us today. Uh, we will be joined by a couple of stellar colleagues to walk you through some of the great questions we've received over the past three months. Uh, first, I would like to introduce a man who needs no introduction is Seb Mounier. Seb, can you join us, please, on camera? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. Good to see you today. Where are you today? Uh, let me think. Uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Grand Forks, North Dakota. It's beet season. Not, it is beet season. I'm not here for too long, just a couple of weeks before heading down to Texas for the winter. Like, uh, like birds. Uh, and then we have a special guest uh, as well. Ryan, can you please join us? Ryan Driscoll. Hello. There he is. A lot of you should know Ryan from support. If you've ever worked with our technical support team, surely you've spoken to Ryan. It's usually Ryan or me, I don't know. And we are uh, blessed with Ryan's presence today to walk you through one of the agenda items. Let me share my screen and introduce you to the agenda. Uh, and we will get to it. So uh, it is a tradition, by the way, there is an interstitial that was created for this uh, particular webinar, Q&A Live. There's this cool animation with audio that was created by our design team. And in the past eight uh, Q&A Lives, I think this is the ninth, nobody's ever been able to really hear it. And I want to make, I actually think I figured out how to help you guys hear it, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to run it silently and you can watch me enjoy it. Here we go. By the way, I think in the, in the recording you post on YouTube, we do get the sound for whatever reason. <laughs> it really is awesome, and you guys are just missing out, but you will never get to hear it as far as I'm concerned. Fingers crossed. So let's walk through the agenda, today's agenda. Uh, this is uh, Ryan will join us to talk about a question we got in support. The, the original question was some variation of how can I export a list, not a list? Fix it in line. A list of players. We have the share and deploy console. You can see all your players in the share and deploy console. And somebody wanted to have an exported list of them. And there is no export button. So how would you do that? Well, there actually is a way to do that. And it's using the share and deploy API, which I suspect some of you don't even know exists. And so Ryan will help walk us through what is that API? How does it work? And how, for example, can you export a list of players? Then we will shift over to analytics. Question we received in support was, is there a way to pre-filter data before export and then export? Not only is there a way, there's two ways. Uh, one of them is using the analytics API. And Seb Mounier is gonna help you uh, understand briefly how you can use the analytics API to do that. But there's actually a, I don't know if easier is the right word. The API is very robust, but there is another alternative means that you may not even know exists for pre-filtering and exporting analytics data. And Seb will show you how to do that. And then finally, we'll shift gears away from exporting stuff. And we're gonna talk about a question we received, is there a way in Intuaface to scan QR codes? Well, as of this moment, not from your perspective, but in fact, uh, Seb and team have created an interface asset for reading QR codes. And he's gonna walk you through that interface asset and uh, show you how it works and get you ready for its availability, which is very soon. I don't know when it is set, but I'm sure you'll uh, So that said, I am now gonna turn it over to Ryan, who is gonna tell you all about the Share and Deploy API. So let me get back to... And just a reminder, while Jeff does that, you have the question box somewhere in the top bar of oh, Good Webinar, you. wherever it is on your screen. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions while Ryan is presenting, what I am presenting, and we'll take these questions afterwards. That's exactly right. The questions panel, we're going to monitor that and answer your questions. And I'm always going to ask some questions at the end of each module. But Ryan, uh, the ball is your, your court. Thanks, Jeff. All right. So um, like Jeff said, I'm going to go over uh, how to go about getting list of players and player information 
and using our share and deploy API, just to start off, there is, we do have a way in which you can get a list of your licenses uh, easily from my Intuit face right up here. There's an export to Excel. It will just take all this information in the, this license menu and put it in Excel. So you can provide that to whomever may need it. Now you, maybe you need more information for your IT department or your CTO. Um, so I'm going to show you how to go about getting that information to do that. We're going to use the, uh, the share and deploy API. This is right here. Now, in order to use this, you're going to need to link your account to it and then also authorize access to it. This is all done by using the credentials key. If you're unfamiliar with the credentials key, you can get one right here on my Intuit face as well. And mine takes a second to load. There we go. And if you haven't created one, you'll use the create new credential key. The important aspect when you create that is you want to make sure that the scope is that's checked is at least share and deploy. You can have the other ones checked as well, but you need to make sure share and deploy is checked. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that. And now you just paste your credential key into here and click authorize. Now what that does is that it goes ahead and that connects to my account and then also um, authorizes me to go and use the service on the account. Now in the share and deploy API, you'll see there's a lot of options here. You can use it to get information. You can also use it to post information. So make changes to an experience, launch an experience or make changes to a player. Right now we're gonna go over just how to get uh, the player information. So if you go under the players section right here where it says get players, you expand that, there's a button here and click try it out. Now in here are all the different parameters that you can set uh, if you want to get specific information. For now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep it so it shows all my player information. I'm going to click the execute button and then this is the statement that it sends out, the curls, the curl statement, but this is the information that I receive. Now, this isn't the easiest to look at and digest, so I'm going to show you how to go about getting that into an Excel document, which will be a lot easier to see. So in Excel, we want to use the data tab. This is where we're going to get the information, and we're going to get it from the web. So you click from web. And we want to expand this to advanced. Now, the URL that we want to use is actually right here, this request URL. If you've gone and made changes up here to any of these options, this URL will look a little different. But I suggest just using the, the standard one without any of the adjustments because we can make those adjustments later in the Excel. One exception might be is if you have a lot of players because it could take some time for it to load up in Excel. So we're going to copy that URL and paste it in there. Now here we need to go ahead and include that uh, the credential key again, which is located right here. You see this is the credential key. We need to title it the category here. So we just select X API key. And you're going to put that right here in the header information and then this is the credential key that we're going to use we copy that that's all the information that you need you click OK now it's going out it's going to retrieve the list of information of course on my other screen there we go now here um, I previously did this so it says it does have my history so I just refresh it nothing changed. You'll see it comes up with this information and says there's five items and there's a list link right here. You want to click that. What that's going to do is that's going to open it up. So that way it'll show you all the information for the items individually. Once you've clicked that, you click to table. You leave everything here as default. You don't need to make any of these changes. Once this, come, this menu comes up, these double arrows, you want to click this. This is where you can select what information you want displayed in your Excel. Um, these are the, the various categories and uh, headers of the different 
information that you'll get. Right now, I'm just going to keep everything checked so I have all the information. And click OK. Now you can see all the different player information that I have in here. And if we hit close and load, it'll actually go through. And now it's in an Excel document, which is a lot easier to digest. And if you want to, you can, it has the filtering options like most, like any other filtered Excel. So if you were to provide this to somebody and they wanted to just filter down to see what they wanted only online, they could go ahead and check that. Now, there are some categories in here that can be expanded even more. And you'll note that these, like right here, I have a tags area here. This um, can be expanded even more. So if you want to go and edit this, you just right click over here on the queries and connections and you can click the edit and it pulls that information back up. Now, any section that can be expanded is going to have those double arrows. And when you expand this, you can, well, that's not the one I want. This is the one I want. You can um, either expand to new rows. What that's going to do is that's going to make individual uh, rows for each item in that, in that column. And it will duplicate the all the uh, previous player information. So you'll see duplicates of that. Or you can do extract values, which I'm going to do here. And that puts it all in one line. And you can go and delimitate it however you like. Uh, right now, I'm just going to use an equal sign and click OK. And then these are all the various tags that I've applied to this particular player. So if I go and I tell it to load again, you'll now see that I have that information here. If you want and you want to have it all of them be in their own individual section and be able to filter it, then you would just uh, use that first option. Now, once you've gone, you've created this and you share it to somebody or you're using it yourself, rather than having to go back through the information again, you can just go right up here and click the refresh button and that will go through and it'll go out and it will refresh the information. Nothing's changed on my end. So nothing's going to refresh right here. But when you click that, that's how you're going to go about refreshing it and getting the new up-to-date information. Do keep in mind, whoever you send this, whoever has access to this will have access to all the information that you allow to be retrieved. So if you ever want to change that information, again, you can come in here and make your changes. You can go through and, and put the request through again and uncheck the values that you do not want to see. So right here, you can come in here and then say if you don't want to see the license information, you can uncheck that and then it will go ahead and, and remove that from that. Putting this back up and um yeah that's how you go about getting the information in uh excel it makes it a little bit easier and like i said the share deploy does have a lot more options um we do have help articles on this that go in a little bit more but you could also use it for various things like posting and, and controlling experiences pushing them if you want to do that remotely as well or making changes to the players themselves Uh, Ryan, thank you for that. I, I had a couple questions, and you just mentioned something about that dovetails with one of them. So okay. We have customers who have built remote controls for absolutely, yeah. deployment, right? Yeah. So yeah. they're they're using the API to control actually when to push experiences, which experience to push, what devices to push. Is that that's right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're definitely doing that. You can just like any other API that you would use in, uh, in Composer and bring it in, you would do the same with ours as well. Um, and you can go in, and all these controls you can do here. Uh, this, I use this a lot for testing purposes. Um, if I want to go and just test it without actually implementing the API into an experience, but want to make changes to it, I can do it this way or, or do pushes. But yes, you can, just like you said, create a remote control like, like a lot of our users have that have a lot of uh, experiences that they want to show.
Yeah, maybe another way to phrase it is they're creating their own share and deploy console, but it's their own look and feel, and it, it just exposes the things they want to do. It could have their own branding. And I, and yeah, I suppose I, this is, well, if you have something to add, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I know, like, you might not see it here, but, like, I know that they've gone and they include, include it where it looks a lot like our share and deploy and where you can go and you can see the images and pictures of your experiences or what your players are showing. Um, they have that included and that, that is certainly a possibility of information that could be fetched too. So you can make it look very dynamic as well. Yeah, I think there's two variations I've seen. One is it's for internal use, but they don't want somebody logging into the share and deploy console. They create their own console. For yes. employees that just exposes what's critical but all the information you see here could be there the other use is if they want to brand something for a client and they don't want yeah. the client to see into a face but they still want to give the client some control yeah. so they'll they'll wrap our api in their own branded api um, and, and maybe this is obvious to most people that understand apis but just to be clear i mean the api is not specific to excel this is excel supports it you can use excel yes. but this API um, can be uh, used anywhere uh, for for export of content. Yeah, this was just data. this was a request that we had seen a couple of times uh, in support. People trying to get the list of all the player information, and this is the most efficient way to get it into a single document. And can you just do me a quick favor and pull Absolutely. up the credential key page again? Yes, sir. Um, because I'm not sure everybody is familiar with the credential key concept. The idea is there's a world of devices out there running player. And mm -hmm. we there needs to be a way for Intuaface to know which of those devices across all of our customers, which are the ones specific to your needs, specific to your actions. So the credential key is how that's done. Mm -hmm. Is it defines uh, the, the device scope. And you can see that there's a data collection scope, web trigger scope, player licensing. There's actually Variety, a variety of ways to use credential keys to remotely initiate activities that are specific to your devices. So you're not mucking about with somebody else's device. And so they're not yes. mucking about with yours. Um, so credential key is not just about share and deploy. Uh, and there's there's actually a lot you can do. Uh, I don't think there's any questions, Ryan. So uh, please stick around. We might have some questions at the end, but thank you very much. All right, will do. Thank you. So the next topic will be uh, let me pull it up, uh, about analytics. So that the question there was, how do I uh, export a pre-filtered list of data points? Um, Seb, why don't you introduce that? I'm ready for you, but why don't you introduce that? Yeah, just a little intro with a little disclaimer. Uh, my internet connection is a bit wonky these days, so I pre-recorded what you're gonna see the next seven minutes, uh, just in case, but I'm sticking here in case you have live questions. The point is, uh, how do I get a subset of the data points that I've been collecting on an event or trade show? Or said otherwise, how can I collect information like a list of email addresses from an experience running in a trade show, running in a showroom, and use that list in an efficient way? The API is one solution, but we're going to look at another one as well, which I find much easier. OK. So I'm going to play that video, and uh, we'll be around for questions. And Seb, we'll be back live if we have uh, any to answer. And if Starlink wants it. All right, let's get into our second topic for today. Uh, we are going to talk about analytics, and in particular, the Analytics API, or how to retrieve some specific data from the interface analytics. Um, the first thing I want to mention is, as you saw with Ryan's demo, uh, we do have a bunch of APIs, right? Most of them are documented with this nice interactive document. We do have one for the analytics. It's not in this list of documentation, but we still have an article about that. It's actually the oldest of all the public APIs we have released. And I'll show you this article in just a second. The second point is, depending on your needs, you may or may not need this API to get the data you're looking for, because we also have this user interface from the analytics data hub in your my interface portal that maybe would solve your your, your issue so uh, before i go into some use case uh, let me jump into um, the the my interface account so if we look into our api guide 
We do have web triggers, we have share and deploy, we don't have anything about REST. Doesn't mean we don't have an API again. So if we go to this article, you search uh, REST and data points or analytics, you will find this article and the link is also in the slide I just showed. So if you watch the recording, you'll get that link again. Uh, we do have these API, which are completely documented here. You can get either XML or JSON format. Uh, so if you want to do the same thing as Ryan demonstrated earlier, use the API within Excel, Microsoft Excel. You can use this endpoint to get an XML format, which Excel will like. And then you have the authentication with the API key, exactly the same behavior, start date, end date, and then a couple of parameters. I will actually not do a complete demo on that because what I want to focus on is, again, depending on your, what your need is, you may not need to get into this API. So the second thing I want to show you is that, you know, we have the analytics dashboards. We've had them for quite a few years now, but we still have this analytics data panel. And even if your intent is just to use the dashboards to create your own charts, I like to go into this analytics data and to download my raw data points into an Excel file just to make sure that I log the right things um, and, and to you know, have some kind of a raw data that I can use to build my charts. Now today the point is, what if I want to retrieve some specific data? And the example we, I'll show you in a second in this live demo is, we have a trade show, we have an event, a showroom, something like that, and we want the guests, the visitors to leave their email address, point of contact. And I just want to retrieve this list of email addresses that happened during the three days of my show. Well, you can use the analytics to log all the uh, interactivity in your experience, how many times a product was seen, how many times a video was played, and as well to collect these email addresses entered using a text input. Now, if you go into the Excel file here, this connector, you can download your data. So, the scenario, let's say the show happened somewhere last week, between last week and today. And if I look at all the data points I have, I'm on my account right now. I'm not including my secondary accounts, but I have about 800 data points. Okay, that's one thing. But how about we filter per device or maybe per experience name or even by event name. So if I type in here, contact form, and that's just because it's the name I used in one of the experiences I created. If I uh, do a search again, now I only have two data points. Let me get back to the experience and we'll see what it looks like. So again, what's the scenario? What's the use case? If you want to get your data after an event, using this Excel export is most likely the fastest way to extract that data. If you want to import this list into a third party tool such as Salesforce, sure, you could look into Salesforce API. You can, I have in the past, it's a nightmare. Uh, working with a marketing team, it has always been easier to just give them an Excel file with the list of email addresses, they remove the columns they don't want, and they import that Excel file into Salesforce. And marketing does what they know how to do. They do a great job at that. There's no need to overcomplexify things when importing an Excel file is fairly easy for them. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm actually going to type in a new demo address here. So let's say this is day two of my show, uh, demo at interface.com. Let's say that's my new email address <coughs> from the visitor for today. And I'm going to collect that data. As usual, when I hit escape, I, I'm in the, the play mode of Composer. I will go back to Composer. This is going to push the data and you know it takes minute or two uh, to get to uh, the data hub. What I want to show here is in this analytics scene, this collect data, what is it actually doing? The button is logging an event using our analytics, using the event name contact form. This is the important information here. This contact form name is again a name I decided to give. So I can use it as well on the My Interface portal to filter all these events and only retrieve these ones. It will happen to have one column, email with the value from the text input. So if I go back to 
our search here. I'm going to do a search again. I can just hit enter. Now I have three instead of two. So let's download that file and see what it looks like. All right, I'm going to open the file. Excel always takes a second. So here we go. We have all our automatic parameters, the name of my device, my player tags, etc. But then if I look at my event name, I only get the ones with the event name I put in my form. These are my tests from yesterday. This is my test for today. Uh, if I were to look on the, the first columns, we would see the dates here. I'm actually recording this just the day before the webinar uh, you are attending right now. And so I can just remove the columns I don't want and send this list of emails again to my marketing team so they can import that into Salesforce, HubSpot, or whatever platform you want. So that's it for the analytics. Just wanted to show again these connector options available into Manage Analytics data. Uh, we're going get to back, get back to the live part of the webinar and see if you have any questions about this topic. Thank you, Seb. Excellent job. You sounded great from North Dakota. Um, I don't see any questions, but as always, I do. Uh, Maybe the, the first one, you said it, but I want to emphasize it because I'm not sure people typically think of it. And, and to be honest, usually when we talk about analytics, we promote it a certain way. We promote it as learn about your users, learn about your audience, what's working, what's not working. And the main use case you presented is not that at all. It's form data. It's collecting information. And, and I think that's a good point to hit, uh, which is that analytics isn't just about analyzing something. You can use that feature to capture data. And I don't know, Seb, in your experience, what's the mix? Is it usually form data? What, how does that among our users? It, it, first of all, what our users are doing, I have no idea uh, because we don't know what you guys are doing <laughs> with the platform. Uh, uh, what I can tell is what I am doing in our own experiences on our booth at Infocom, at IEC, at the various trade shows we've attended in the past and we are going to attend in the, in the coming years. And I like to use the analytics for both use cases, one, knowing what's happening in the experience, two, collecting data from the users for several reasons. Uh, number one, I use only one tool, so it's always you know easier. Number two, instead of connecting to the API of Salesforce in real time, which again is a nightmare <laughs> to do, and relying on the internet connection at the show to push the information to Salesforce in real time, which would be a very bad mistake to do, uh, relaying on a trade show internet connection. Uh, I can rely on the analytics because they work offline. So even if I lose the connection at the show, I will still collect all these email addresses locally on the device. And after the show, I can bring the device back to the office, connect it to the internet, and then uh, get all these emails back uploaded to the interface cloud. So this gives me peace of mind that I will not lose any data because the analytics is logging all the data offline first and then pushing to the cloud if the cloud is available. Uh, and, you know, I even historically, I remember promoting there, you can write directly into an Excel file from a two of them, right? You don't have to use analytics form and the data is written into a file that's local to the device. You can do that and it would work offline. It would work. Problem is, it's device specific, so every device would have its own independent copy of own data. Yeah, it, so you, I, we have usually between five and eight devices on a booth at a time, but for an interface booth at a trade show, uh, I don't want to run around with a USB key on eight devices when I'm dismantling the booth. <laughs> I have other things to do. Uh, and when it's a Windows machine, it's kind of easy to get that Excel file, but if it's a bright sign, if it's an iOS, if it's an iPad, it's a nightmare to access the file system as well. I don't even know if we can, to be honest. So using the analytics just pushes all that data from my eight devices into one place, and then I can download that one Excel file, and which already does the job of aggregating all that data from all my devices. Thank you for that. One, one smaller question, uh, because you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, I'm on the marketing side of the house and I'll get data sets and I need to clean the data set before import. I have to delete columns that are irrelevant or rename. I, I want to confirm that there is no way to prevent Intuaface from writing the automatically collected parameters. That's correct, right? 
I can't prevent that in the export? That's correct. Okay. So all of that information, which could be useful for you, I don't know, but if you don't need it, well, it's going to be there. You have to delete it. There's no way to shut it off. Um, you yeah, it's always easier to, to delete too much information than add missing information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you don't want to retroactively realize you forgot to collect something. Yep. All right, that's great. So I think we can, well, I don't see any uh, submitted questions. So we have a, a nice context switch. Let's get into a, an interface asset for reading QR codes. Tell us about it, Seb. Um, honestly, the intro is in, again in that recorded session. So far, no internet drops, so that's good. Uh, just one thing for all of you who are live today with us, grab your phone, uh, remove the cover from your camera. We're going to need you to participate in this demo, even if it's a recorded one. Very exciting. All right. Uh, I am ready on my end. Uh, let's enjoy Seb virtual. Okay. Let's get to our last but not least uh, topic for today, the QR code reader. So even though this is pre-recorded for the webinar for internet connectivity, potential issues on my end, um, you can still participate. So now is the time to grab your phone, uh, make sure your uh, camera is open or whatever app you use to scan QR codes first. Uh, and so you can follow along with me. Even if you're watching the recording of this webinar, you can still tag along. So on my end, I'm going to start the recording on my phone. So I will put the video also on screen of what I see exactly. Uh, I'm going to start with the demo first, and then we go into the use cases and the why we are even talking about that. But I think the demo is is better. So the first thing I want you to do is just open your regular uh, webcam, or again, anything that can scan the code, and then click on the link <clears throat> that is encoded into this particular QR code. You are now running an experience in the web browser on your phone, whether you have an Android phone or an iOS phone. Uh, you should see something like what you see on my screen on the side. Uh, you can actually just press the start button, play around. You will see it's our interface overview presentation, the regular one for mobile, um, except it has a little twist, this uh, not so well designed camera button in the bottom left corner. Uh, that's just the demo for today to give you an idea about what you can do with this new interface set. So I'm gonna, <clears throat> on my laptop, I will display a tag and let's imagine you are visiting us at a trade show. Uh, you come to our booth, IEC 25, you scan that first QR code at the entrance, you get this on your phone, and now you can move around the booth. You can search for these QR codes and then open the camera on the phone here. Uh, probably switch to the back camera. Something like this. There are some error messages that my phone has too many cameras. We need to get rid of that. Uh, and now if I try and scan the code here, you will see it shows Composer on the phone with an Xflow button. If I click that, now it brings me to the Composer scene in this particular experience, and I can start learning more things about Composer. On the laptop here, I'm going to switch to another QR code somewhere else on the booth. Again, reopening my camera. It remembers which one I want to use, HCMS explore and now i get the content on this hcms on my phone again you see that on my screen so what's happening here we are using on the phone an experience running on the web with a new qr code reader interface set that enables you to read a qr code from any camera feed whether it's a phone camera whether it's a webcam on a kiosk and, <coughs> and these are some very cool use cases so let's dive into these use cases. What can you do with that? Um, first scenario, that's kind of the one I demonstrated here. Uh, you have some static QR codes displayed, printed on the wall, displayed on the screen, on any kind of panel. In a museum, a trade show booth, a showroom, you have visitors, you want them to navigate in that space and get new information each time they get to a new demo station while remaining in the same experience on the phone which they didn't have to install interface player. They didn't have to install any app. They just scan the code at the entrance that loads the experience as a web page running in their browser. And then we can jump from scenes to scenes or from content to content uh, using the QR code reader feature of that particular experience. 
learn more about an artifacts in the museum, learn more about a product in a booth, get the documentation of that product, etc. The second scenario is <clears throat> actually kind of what I, I did in the demo here. It's some kind of dynamic QR code, which could be displayed on an experience, an interface experience running on the screen. And one scenarios we've discussed before with some of our customers is having, you know, like an uh, executive briefing center or some kind of showroom with quizzes for the audience. And so you could have, again, the audience scan a first QR code to load an experience. And then when we move around the different demos, there's a quiz with a session ID which is unique to this particular group of visitors. So all the information is kind of the same, but it has the session ID so you can keep their score at the end of the game, at the end of the whole session across the different stations. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Paolo is going to be attending this webinar, and I'm pretty sure this is the kind of thing that could end up at the Museum of Flight in Seattle very, very soon. So this will open up again some new scenarios. The last, <coughs> sorry, the last scenario is actually the opposite. So imagine you have some kind of printed uh, QR code or downloaded QR code on your phone, maybe from an email or, or something like that. And then you go to a kiosk, so a physical in-venue location, which has a webcam, like not an expensive barcode scanner, a regular webcam, and you just show that code to the webcam. The webcam can decode the data and maybe give you a coupon for the kiosk or maybe you enable you to check in in the hotel uh, or any kind of event. So it again opens existing scenarios maybe where you had to use a barcode scanner, a 2D code scanner before, uh, some very specific device, where now you can just use a regular webcam. Maybe it's an... Maybe it's an iPad used as a kiosk. Maybe it's an all-in-one screen with an embedded webcam. Uh, again, we're trying to simplify the access to the data embedded and coded within QR codes here. So that's the context. These are the uh, use cases we thought of. Let us know in the questions, in the comments, uh, when we go back to the live, if you have other ideas, if it opens up some, some discussions here, I'm, I'm really, eager to listen to you guys and see what you would do with that. So how does it work? <clears throat> well, again, it's a new interface asset. Uh, right now, it is trying to access my webcam, which I'm using to record, which is why you see the loading indicator here. It cannot use it at the same time. And my laptop webcam is dead. Don't ask me why. So this interface asset will ship off the shelf in the next composer uh, we are going to release. In the meantime, if you want to try it uh, right now, send me an email. You have Jeff's email address. You have probably have my email address, maniatinterface.com. Uh, drop me an email. I'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, the way it works is basically you first select which camera you want to use. So on my laptop right now, it sees my external Logitech, this one, and my Intel one, which is dead. On my phone, it would see four because I have a Samsung with two front and two rear cameras, wide angle and normal. So we still have to figure out how to make this part a little bit easier, but it will always select the first one by default and try to run it. And then you can either let the user decide manually which one you want to use. So you can switch from one to another or just switch and cycle through them, which is what you probably did if you scanned that code a few minutes ago. Then you can decide to start the recognition, let it run. When you're not using it, you can stop the recognition, save some CPU power. <clears throat> and if an image contains a QR code and it's detected, you will get a trigger with the QR code data as the trigger parameter. So fairly straightforward to use. Uh, you will get some errors like the little red text you saw in the version that hasn't been cleaned yet in the demo. Um, some things are still in the works to understand exactly on all the devices how these cameras work. But that's in a nutshell the properties, triggers, and actions you will get with this interface set. Important note, this works on, quote, asterisk, all player platforms. But we tested it on Android, iPhone, iPads. And if you want to use it on Windows, you have to use player next gen on Windows. 
So hopefully you have read the newsletter that we sent my today, which is your yesterday, October 1st, basically, uh, about player next gen for Windows being available with an installer. Ask us, you will get the link to download that. The this will become the new interface player for Windows in a few months officially. So basically it works everywhere except on our current slash soon to be classic interface player on Windows, the .NET version. That's it for how the interface set works. I'm pretty sure we're gonna get a lot of questions here. So let's jump back to the live and uh, hopefully if my internet stays up, uh, I can uh, answer all of these along with Jeff. All right, Seb, thank you very much. Um, I'm still here. I, I will open the table to our guests. But as always, uh, I always need to know more. So um, QR code content. I, I can't recall if you mentioned this, but I, I think I'm right. The QR code was, I, look, this is my bias, so I could be wrong. I've always thought QR code, when I first was introduced to QR codes, QR code equaled URL. That's how I thought of it. The QR code equals URL. But in fact, it's just text, right? It's, yep. it's, and so even in your example, those QR codes were not encoding a URL, they were encoding the product name. Is that what it was? Yes. So the first QR code you saw was actually a URL. That's the one you scanned ah. with just your regular phone camera, right. whatever app you use. And that's to get to the web.interface.com slash the name of my experience. So you could run that experience. Then within the experience, the two additional codes you scan, the composer and the HCMS, actually, if they looked much simpler on the screen, uh, because they were encoding just the words composer and HCMS. Now, the way I I, I built that, and it, it could be URLs, it could be an email address, it could be whatever QR code, right? I, I'm not saying that our QR code reader can only read simple QR codes. Nope. <laughs> uh, it's the same QR code reader as your phone, most likely. Um, the uh, the difference is, it, I did that. I built that yesterday afternoon for the demo, and what I did is, when the code is scanned, navigate to a scene where the scene name is the text scanned in the code. My scenes happen to have the name composer and CMS, so I just put these names, these scene names, into the QR code. So I had one trigger to do. I can put five QR codes because I have five scenes in that experience, and it would work. And my job was done in two minutes. <laughs> you, That's the only you reason. Could have, you, you could have structured it so when the tag was detected, you would automatically navigate to the, the scene, right? That This extra step I, you gave us to explore, I, you didn't have to do that, right? So I, I did. I have that one trigger. Actually, uh, while we go through the other questions, I'm going to open that experience and I can show you the trigger. Uh, but what I was doing is, um, of course, I'm on the wrong account. Give me a second. I will show you that. Okay. But the, um, and again, sometimes I'm writing notes. Maybe you said it and I missed it. The reason on Windows that Player Next Gen, which is beta right now, is recommended is because you use TypeScript to create right. these interface assets, which requires the Next Gen runtime that underlies Player. Um, and the uh, kind of current gen Windows player doesn't support that. That's one of the TypeScript things. Well, Jeff, we're losing your voice a little bit at the end. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just saying that current gen player on Windows doesn't work with TypeScript based interface assets, and you use TypeScript because that's the future for all player players. I mean, that's that's where it's going on Windows. Yes. Uh, I'm going to share my screen just for a second. Uh, entire screen. So hopefully you can see it. So I have this uh, QR code reader interface set in this, you know, phone-based project, and that one trigger I added was was this. Um, when a QR code is detected, I am setting a text, which is the the text that will go in here in this hidden group. And you're right, I did add this, this uh, intermediate step for you to manually decide where to go. Uh, I could have done scan, scan the code, go to the scene. 
uh, I could have done that. I'm just setting this value, so setting the text using the QR code data that comes with this QR code detected trigger. When you click the explore button, what I'm doing is I am navigating to a scene where the name of the scene is actually that detected text, that value. So again, I can have two codes or 10 codes, the job is done. Um, I only added this intermediate step so it doesn't blink if you had the, the codes right next to each other and you keep scanning them very quickly. Uh, and because it reminded me of the experience I have on my phone, when I scan the code, I get this little pop-up with the link and I can decide to click on it or not. I found it was a bit more user-friendly. But that's interesting and that's an important point too. If I have two QR codes right next to each other, which I'm not saying is a good idea, it's not. I guess it, it, it'll just keep <laughs> scanning each URL. It, it just keeps going back and forth, I guess. Um, it's not a discrete that sees one and it stops detecting. It just keeps detecting, keeps detecting. Keeps detecting. Maybe. Uh, honest, to be honest, I didn't test that much uh, into that. What we did, though, in this code is to avoid having code detected, code detected, code detected over and over again. So when you scan, let's say, QR code number one, and you remain looking at that QR code number one, you will get that trigger once, and then for a set period of time, you will not get the trigger again if you keep scanning the same code. If you move to QR code number two, you will get a new trigger. So if you do with your phone one, two, one, two, you will get all the triggers. But if you get stuck on one code, you will get the trigger only once, unless you stay more than, I don't know, X seconds looking at that one single code. Okay. Okay. And but and it works with all cameras. You have the ability to to cycle through them. I mean, even on i on my little Android here, I've got two or three cameras. They all work with QR. It doesn't matter. You can use whatever yes. you want, right? Uh, in, in the end, what we are doing is we are using a third-party library that looks into an image, a fixed, a static image, and tries to decode a QR code. So we are sending that library snapshots of the camera every half second something like that so the only thing the camera's doing is helping you generate that image the actual it, processing is not nothing to do with the camera correct okay which is why it'll work any camera any device because it doesn't really matter we're just trying to get take a picture a, a, any camera that can kind of focus on the QR code so the QR code data is you know readable uh, and that's one of the things that I would, before we actually release it publicly in, in with our next composer release, I want to work with our product team to see if we can avoid these error messages you saw on my recording, or maybe when you try it on your phone, because there are so many cameras on nowadays phones that I would love to be able to just select front and rear and not have to go through from front close angle, front wide angle, back wide angle. No, I just want the back regular angle. I want the simple one. Uh, so far, I couldn't see how to do it myself in the code because that's what the API does. Uh, it's a web standard API. And so I need to talk with our product team to see if we can make this a little bit easier. Which is one of the reasons we're still sitting on it. Yeah. I, I don't see any of the questions, Seb. I don't know if you have anything else to add. I had one other unrelated thing to add, but. No, uh, uh, as I said that in my recording, I thought Paolo would be here. He's actually in the plane, but he had a preview of that last night. So he knows about it. <laughs> and he will have some scenarios already on that with it. It's, um, I, again, you, you created an interface asset. You didn't do something a customer could not do. That's a good point. Well, building assets, but it, it, you didn't cheat. <laughs> Uh, besides, the code was written 70% by ChatGPT and, and Louis, and then I just did the 30% cleaning and wording with you uh, uh, to make it a bit more user-friendly and, and composer-friendly. But most of the code, uh, that, that's an important point, actually. Being able to decode a QR code from a webcam is not a feature we have in Interface. But with this interface asset, this is something that 
I could add to interface without being an interface team member, meaning you could do the same. Any one of you who can write TypeScript or use ChatGPT to write TypeScript uh, could have built that. that. That's a very important point. Uh, maybe one other thing which I did not show in the video is that the actual feed, which you see in the experience, the, the video itself, this is the regular webcam asset uh, that I use. And the only thing I did was to bind the name of the camera to use from in the webcam asset to the selected camera property of that new interface asset. So basically, you see in the webcam asset what the QR code reader is trying to use. So you have the same feed. Uh, and that's probably why sometimes we get some errors, because trying to use two feeds at the same time that might, be, might be one of the issues. But that's the little trick here. And uh, you know, you've, I don't even want to get into using ChatGPT writing code. I mean, that's probably a Q&A live all by itself in your love-hate relationship with that thing. But uh, that's a yeah, whole other definitely. topic. Um, but it's just cool to know that it was used to some extent. I, I wanted to wrap up today with uh, a reminder that, as we have for the past few years, Interface will be at ISC 2025 in Barcelona. Uh, Post-COVID, this is our third or fourth, I think, um, return to this show. It's the biggest AV show on the planet. And uh, if you use that code you see on screen, you will get exhibit hall access for free. You'll be able to register for free. Maybe you can register for the whole thing for free. I'm never sure about the scope. I have to double check. But certainly the exhibit hall, which I think the show attracts oh, about 100,000 people now. There's something like 3,000 plus vendors uh, across multiple halls. It's an amazing show. Uh, we will have a booth there. I, Seb, unfortunately, will not be there. No, Ryan, for that matter. You're stuck with me. But a whole bunch of other people who are a lot smarter will be with, uh, with me as well at the show. So if you're anywhere near uh, Barcelona, if you want to visit Barcelona, we will be there February 4th to 7th for uh, ISC. Um, but Ryan, if you're still there, thank you very much. I hope you're still there. Out. Yeah, I'm here. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, uh, Seb, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. It's freaky. And uh, thank you to all the folks who joined. As always, we've recorded this webinar. We'll make it available. And uh, you can watch it uh, the next time you get this, or wherever you like to watch videos. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.